Hello and welcome to everyone uh, to our next session in the Congressional App Challenges Back to School webinar series, IP for Apps, presented by the USPTO. Uh, my name is Joe Lessy and I'm the director of the Congressional App Challenge. Uh, in the Congressional App Challenge, Congress has created the largest series of concurrent coding competitions anywhere in the world. And it's students like you that make this incredible program possible. Last year, Congressional App Challenges were held in over 10, or held for over 10,000 students across 48 states. We're expecting an even greater competition this year. Eligible students can register and submit their original apps to this year's App Challenge through October 19th. The United States Patent and Trademark Office is the federal agency for granting US patents and registering trademarks. And now I'd like to present a special message from a deputy director of the USPTO, Laura Peter. Hello everyone and welcome to this workshop for the 2020 Congressional App Challenge. Started in 2015, this challenge seeks to inspire students across the country, such as you, to take interest in coding and computer science. I am so excited to see so many of you getting involved in this year's challenge. Coding and smartphone applications are now an inseparable part of modern life. Not only connecting us and making many daily tasks much easier than they used to be, but also allowing us to solve some of the world's most pressing problems. Take, for instance, the story of Kavya Koparapu. While she was still in high school, Kavya developed a 3D printed lens attachment to pair with a smartphone app that screens for partial blindness caused by diabetes. Why did she do this? because her grandfather was afflicted with the condition and she wanted to help others who might be as well. And just last month, Kavya was awarded her first patent for an innovation called GlioVision, which is a method for diagnosing brain tumors use, using artificial intelligence to analyze images of biopsies. Traditional diagnostic methods for brain tumors were expensive slow, and many patients would unfortunately pass away before their diagnosis would return from the lab. And Kavya's innovation has helped to solve these problems to bring quicker, more personalized treatments for brain cancer. This is on top of being named one of Time Magazine's 25 most influential teens in 2018. What a cool accomplishment. Kavya believes that students like you have a unique perspective. She said, when we look at problems as they can be solved in the future, not as they are constrained by the technology right now. All of you here today are proof that you are never too young to have a great idea. And it is now more than ever that we need your brilliance. Many of our past participants in the app challenge have created apps that solve real world problems. These include a famine risk index early detection system, which maps the relationship between droughts and populations at risk of famine. Then there's the Safe Travel app that allows for travel tracking and automatic sending of any emergency notifications and route interruptions to designated contacts. And Stories About You, or Say, is a disaster relief app that aids children by allowing them a platform to share their stories. At today's workshop, our education team will teach you how to plan and protect your inventions so that one day you may hold a patent like Kavya. The ideas represented in this virtual setting today, your ideas, will help make the world a better place. You are America's future, and I hope you will continue to grow as leaders in computer science and use your unique talents and ingenuity to help others. You have already started blazing your own trails and we are looking forward to helping you along your journeys of innovation. In the wise words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, what lies behind you and what lies in front of you pales in comparison to what lies inside of you. I am excited to see what comes out of this year's challenge. Thank you and good luck to all of you. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Joyce Ward from the USPTO. 
Uh, USPTO is one of the original supporters of the Congressional App Challenge, and their team is here today to speak to app challengers about how to develop and protect their apps. Joyce? Thank you, Joe, and we are super excited to be here. As Joe said, my name is Joyce Ward, and I'm from the USPTO. I serve as the Director of Education, and we have an amazing team of USPTO um, team here this evening to uh, work with you on the Congressional App Challenge and what you need to know about intellectual property and hopefully to take you through some fun, ha fun hands-on activities. Um, as Deputy Director Peter said, welcome and let the journey begin. Go ahead, Jorge. So actually, uh, my name is Tanaga, and before we get started, we're going to just mention um, what's in the disclaimer that any product or icon or name of any company, we, we are definitely not endorsing those companies or products. We are just aiming to use those things for educational purposes. Here's the team. Um, you'll find you'll be working with each of us in the breakout session, so you'll get to know us a little bit better. So we're gonna go ahead and rock and roll. But before we get to the actual program, a couple things I want to say. This session is intended to be hands-on. We want you to have a lot of fun um, as much as we possibly can. Usually we do these workshops live and in person, and so it's a lot easier, but we're gonna do the best we can to try to make sure that you have a fun and worthwhile experience. So um, go ahead, Jorge, and I think we're going to take it away. Let's see what the first slide. Actually, let me just go ahead and tell you how we're gonna be doing things today. We mentioned that IP for apps. This is not a coding workshop. It's actually an intellectual property workshop. It is a workshop designed to tell you the things that you should be thinking about as a developer while you're coding and working on your really cool and awesome apps, there are some things that you should know as a developer. Um, intellectual property is that thing that you need that will help you uh, in the long run to protect you. We have a five step process. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to get through all five steps, but we will focus on the three that are highlighted here. App chat, you're gonna do some brainstorming and come up with a really cool name for your app. Captivate, what's captivating about your app? What are those things that stand out about your app? Is it the logo? Is it the slogan? Slogan? How will people remember you? And what kind of protection would you need to actually ensure that you can use your name, logo, and slogan? And then thirdly, we're gonna do Insta app. We're gonna actually try to uh, do at least three screens of your app that you're going to create tonight. So. I hope you're in for a fun time. Um, and we also, let me put this out here. The most exciting thing I think we have for you tonight is a young lady that's coming to you who created an amazing app um, at the age of 15. We have Rhea here with us. Hang on after the questions that we're gonna uh, ask you, we're gonna have her come up and tell you exactly what motivated her to do this app. Why did she feel the need to get some intellectual property? She just got a patent. We're super, super excited to have Rio over there. <laughs> Rio, she's the superstar for tonight. But before we get to Rhea, we really want to lay the foundation for why we're doing this session. It's so important that you remember these things. And we'll, um, at the end of the session, we'll tell you how you can get in touch with us if you have follow-up questions. So go ahead, Jorge, take it away. Okay, our first question is, um, we have a little poll, so you can either do this online on your computer or on your cell phone. The first question we want to throw out there is just what is intellectual property? And so in order to respond to this poll, you can either go to pollev.com forward slash my first name, J-O-R-G-E, or you could use your text messaging. You could text the name J-O-R-G-E to the recipient is 22333. You do this only once to join the poll. There'll be several questions forthcoming. And then um, once you're in, you can select the answer of your choice. So what is intellectual property? Um, the poll is open. So uh, as soon as you type in, all right, we got our first Respondent, ideas in your head, A, oops. Okay, so this is updating in real time. <clears throat> um, all right, okay.
All right. I'll give you another, what, 30 seconds. Miss Tanaga, what you call it. <laughs> wow. Um, these are interesting responses. And just know it is OK if you don't get the answer correct, because we know there are some questions here that, may, that you may be unfamiliar with and some of the terms, but we're going to work through this. Um, a is kind of a good, uh, a good uh, answer choice, but it's not really just the idea. Intellectual property is something that actually takes a tangible physical form. It's those really cool things in your head, but just like copyright, poems, songs, all of those really cool and interesting ideas you have, have to take a tangible form. We have to be able to see them or touch them or do something with them. So I'm gonna say, Dr. V, the best answer is D. Yes, most of you got that answer correct. 77%, go to the head of the class, you guys are, Brilliant. Next question. Ms. Tanaga, I think uh, the audience is paying attention to you because I think once they heard, they heard you talk, I think everybody <laughs> We got a few more choices. <laughs> That's great. They're eager. That's good. That means they are engaged. All right. All right. Oh, well, this is interesting. Go ahead, Jorge. Tell them how we were going to move forward with this. Um, well, uh, we want to see if uh, you can recall um, or how well you know your app. So we wanted you to take a moment without looking at your phone or Googling um, uh, to use your camera, I guess, to share uh, what the logos um, look for Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. So if you take a moment and uh, if you can just draw. And it looks like, um, yeah. Dr. V, that most oh, people- Oh, excellent. Have... Somebody's trying to draw up there. Perfect. Looks Excellent. like someone's adding something. Uh huh. Excellent. Okay. And you can also put a description in the chat if you like. Okay. Twitter, it goes a bird. Thank you. Thank you. And and Joy said yes. Joy. Varesh. Okay, we're seeing lots of. Oh, uh, I love it, Arvin. Good answers it's... in the chat. Excellent. Um, oh, Arvin, I love your answer. Unmute yourself. You are amazing. I love your answer. Uh, can we unmute mute Arv, Arv, Arvin, uh, Joe? Arvin, are you there? Should have uh, an opportunity to unmute now. Arvin, do you want to tell us your answer? Oh. It said it won't let him. Oh, it says he's, he can't. Oh, you know what? Had the wrong person. There we go. Arvin, can you join us? Can you hear us? Nope, he says he can't join. But let me go ahead and say what Arvin said. It was awesome. He said white bird with blue something. I couldn't read all of it. But you know, some of you just said a little bird. Well, it's very, very important to actually um, pay attention to the icon that you use. And in this case, color is important. You have never, ever seen Twitter with a white bird in a yellow box. You won't see that, right? It's consistent. We, branding is very important. So thank you for being so exact, Arvin. Go to the head of class. Do we have any takers on Facebook? What about Facebook? Michael, Michael Batavia is holding up a drawing in the camera. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Let's see, Michael. Oh, ex excellent. Let's see. Great. I love the F. Perfect. That is, as one of the fourth grade students used to say, it's perfect. Love it. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> okay. What about TikTok? Thank you, Michael. What about TikTok? Anybody get? Oh, do you have TikTok as well, Michael? I think all three of them. Oh, yeah. Outstanding. Oh, nice. Outstanding. <laughs> Love it. Now, what colors are included in the TikTok uh, app? Good. Red, blue. Yes. Love it. Go ahead, Dr. V, and show us um, the next screen to see if we can get a confirmation on what those are. Drum roll, please, everybody. <laughs> Excellent. In case you didn't remember, here they are. It is so important. We're talking about intellectual property. 
Why is it important? You're not going to see them flipping or changing their colors from time to time because as uh, Joyce Ward is going to tell you a little bit about trademark, it is so important for them to be consistent with their colors and their letters and whatever that brand is because she'll let you know, hang, hang on just a few more slides and she'll tell you exactly why it's important to have a white bird, blue background or white F blue background. Dr. V, next slide, please. Okay. So the question here is, as you guys can read, what can developers do to prevent others from making or using or copying their app? So you have four choices. Um, if you're ready to, oh, there you go, and they're off and running. Ta -da 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 -da. Here we go. So what can developers like yourselves do to prevent others from either making, using, or copying your app? Wow, these are interesting responses. Wow. You know what? I absolutely love this group. You know why? Because the answer really is B. But I'm not going to tell you why it's B. I'm going to tell you why it's not D and why it's not A. So license isn't, that was kind of a red herring. License is not really a protection. That is something that you do when you're ready to kind of get some royalties and someone's interested in your app and they want to kind of have permission to use it. So you would execute a license agreement. They would generally pay you what we call a royalty. C, definitely software isn't a protection. Software is something that you create, right? To get the computer to talk and to do whatever you want it to do um, generally. D, trademark and software protection. So trademark is the right answer, but software protection isn't. So you are absolutely correct. It's patent protection to stop people from making and using, and you would use copyright protection to stop people from copying. Notice those are two different forms of protection. Patent stops you from making or using, and copyright protection from copying, literally copying your thing. So in some cases you'll find out today, you might just need to do both. Okay, go ahead, Dr. V. All right. Okay, our next question in this set is, what can developers do to prevent someone from using a name? We just went through a few names before that is either the same or similar to an existing app or one app that you're developing. So what, what can you do to prevent someone from using that, that name or a similar name? And we'll learn a little bit more about that from Ms. Joyce Ward. Okay. Wow. Wow. No endorsement here, but I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm loving the fact that you guys are getting this. This is so awesome. Yes, it is in fact trademark protection, same or similar. But there's something interesting, and I think um, Ms. Ward is going to talk to you a little bit about that um, uh, in terms of trademark. We talk about a little bit about confusion. So there, you can sometimes use the same name. Sometimes you can use a similar name, but there is a limitation on that, and she will tell us a little bit more about that. But there are times when in fact you definitely can't use the same name or a similar name that someone else is using if it causes blank. Okay, next, next, <laughs> next. <laughs> Ms. Ward's gonna tell, ah, here we are. Ah, yay, and here we are. <laughs> so just in terms of trademarks, what Tanaga, um, uh, Mr. Naga mentioned is trademark protection. And when you were drawing your images uh, for the Facebook and Twitter logos, you were drawing the trademark. So what is a trademark? It basically is a source indicator. And I use the word source because it tells you where something comes from or who's responsible for it. You might not know what that source is, but you know it comes from one place. So again, I wanna get you guys involved with the chat. If you see those arches that are black on this screen, but if you see those golden arches, what are you expecting from there? Next, if you see that emblem up in the top left corner with those women on it, and it's cookie time, what organization do you know that that is? Where do those cookies come from? The same is true for the, the, um, the, the apple there with the bite out. 
Um, and then I've got to tell you, I'm a North Carolina Tar Heel. So when I see that jump man there, I know that is who. Oh, yeah. I'm going to look at the, I'm going to look, all right. All right, Joy Bala, you have it. Michael Jordan, that's right. So that's what good and strong trademarks do. They tell you the source of products or services. They allow you to distinguish them and to identify them so that you don't confuse them with other products or services. Next slide. So we've talked about trademarks. So there are a lot of things that can function as a trademark. For example, those images that you drew, you didn't write out the word Twitter or Facebook or TikTok, but we all knew what those marks refer to. So trademarks can be designs, they can be words, they can actually be words and designs. In some instances, they might be sounds, um, they can even be shapes. That's the cool thing about trademarks is that just about anything you can imagine can function as a trademark, so long as it identifies source and it distinguishes the source of goods and services from another. So in the chat, who can tell me what that logo is there on the screen? If I see that, what is the product that I'm gonna go out and buy? All right, okay, I see lots of good answers, lots of right answers in there. <laughs> I, like that. I like that one, ba -ba. no, <laughs> correct. That is the logo for Starbucks. All right, let's have our next one. <laughs> all right, when I see that check mark, does that mean I got all the answers right on my homework? What is that? That's right. Um, Karen just put that in there. Nike. We've got lots of Nike answers in there. When I see that swoosh, whether it's on a t-shirt or on shoes, then I know that that came from a particular company, a particular source. And then I think we've got one more, Mr. Jorge, Dr. V. We've got that bullseye. What is Woo! that? Okay, wow, you all are fast. You know your trademarks. All right, perfect. Yes, exactly. That is Target. And so what we want you to think about is just when you're doing your app, you want to think about your source. You want people to immediately know, hey, this was Joy's, this was Carbon's, this is who came up with this product. And you don't want them to get it confused with another app out there that maybe has a similar feature, but isn't the same thing. Looks like we have a question. Okay. It looks like Hort, looks okay. like Dr. D has a question as well. So why don't I look at the chat while you all are answering the app? All right, I'm just going to read it out. I think, I think everybody in the audience is already responding, but it, it is better. So this is true or false. It is better for app developers to use a word instead of a design. Now, Ms. Ward just talked about words and designs in uh, her discussion about trademarks um, for apps. What do you think? Is it true, false, or depends? Oh, wow. Am I allowed to look at my phone for a tip? For a <laughs> <laughs> no, you just got to know. You just got to You know. have no lifelines either. <laughs> so that is so funny because um, for me, I think the obvious answer is, as a matter of fact, just go ahead and look at your phone for a second. And write in the chat, in the chat feature, do you see icons that have um, words or do you see designs? Or do you see both? Excellent. One person said design, but most people are saying I see both. It is in fact true, it's both. If you have the um, Burger King app, they have the entire word. If you have the Ring app, it's the entire word. If you have um, McDonald's, they use a design. Duncan, they use kind of word, Duncan kind of, and um, a design. So the question is, when you're creating or deciding what you want your app icon to look like, you have to figure that out. You can't go with a 26 letter word. <laughs> it's not going to fit on that app, that little, little square that you see. If color matters, like I love that magenta one, I love the T-Mobile app, I love the T-Mobile brand, I love that magenta, right? I don't even have to see the guy, I don't even have to see the CEO. When I see magenta, I know, because it's not just any magenta, it's like T-Mobile magenta, right? So colors matter, you gotta be intentional about what you're trying to do. 
uh, designs matter and whether you want words, okay? Does air fryer have an app? <laughs> <I'm> so, not... <laughs> ahead, uh, and I was just gonna say, I know I've seen a few questions. We are definitely gonna take those. I know we want to get our young inventor app developer up. And so we're gonna pause on the questions, go to our young inventor. And then we will. We promise we will answer all of the questions that Excellent. are put in the chat. Thank you, thank you, Miss Ward. Okay, here we go. Are we going to put her on now? Yes. How are we doing time? Okay, sounds good. Five thirty, absolutely. Um, Chris, you want to go ahead and introduce our special guest? Definitely, yeah. Um, so hi everyone. My name is Chris. I'm, I'm with the uh, education team, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Ria Shah. So let me tell you just a quick bit about her. Um, as a 15-year-old inventor um, in high school, as a freshman, she uh, she was the founder and president of a company that she came up with. Um, so after hearing more than once the story of her mother's false positive contractions before her birth, she wanted to create a pregnancy contraction monitoring device um, paired with a mobile app to help women measure their contractions remotely and make better informed decisions. Uh, the device, which has been clinically validated, has granted a patent from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in March of 2020. Uh, currently, the My Fetal, My Fetal Life app has over 33,000 users. Uh, Rhea continues to follow her passion for innovation. She has filed several additional patents for related medical devices and has raised capital from investors. She is currently a first-year student at Georgia Tech pursuing a degree in biomedical engineering as a full-ride Stamps President Scholar. Um, so again, thank you for joining us, Ria. It is my uh, pleasure to introduce to you all Ria Shah. Thank you so much for that introduction, Chris. I really appreciate the USPTO team and the Congressional App Challenge team for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone. So good evening. Um, my name is Ria Shah, and I'm the founder and president of a pregnancy healthcare company called Fetal Life. And I'm truly honored to be here today and have the pleasure of speaking to you all. So first of all, congratulations to all of you for all your hard work in getting here today. Um, the Congressional App Challenge is definitely a prestigious competition. And I'm appalled by all the creative minds that fill this call. I mean, your answers to these questions were absolutely amazing and very creative. To think differently is truly a talent. And each one of you has an innovative spirit within you if you're here at this competition, creating an app and finding a solution to a key issue. I too was driven by a passion for curiosity and my love for problem solving, just like many of you. So there was something just unusually fascinating to me about ideas and you really never know when you'll get an innovative idea. My journey with innovation actually got started when I was a 15 year old freshman in high school. I was inspired by my mom's story about when she was pregnant with me. Since this was her first pregnancy, she didn't really know what to expect, what not to expect. And she also used to face numerous instances of false positive contractions. So this not only caused her to have to make frequent trips back and forth to the hospital, but also she was faced with this unnecessary stress, anxiety, and not to mention the very expensive hospital bills from having to visit the hospital so many times. Realizing the emotional and financial burdens that um, were placed upon my mom during her pregnancy because of false positive contractions, I really wanted to figure out a way to help other pregnant women out there who might be going through similar struggles. So that's when I invented a contraction monitoring device and a mobile app to help pregnant mothers not only record their contractions remotely with the device, but also be able to self-manage other aspects of her health needs through the app. Based on the device and app, I started up a company called Fetal Life. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> oh, thank you. Fetal Life solution now includes four main components, which all help to provide a holistic approach to care throughout the entire pregnancy journey. The solution is composed of patented medical devices, the My Fetal Life app, our telemonitoring platform, and our telemedicine platform. The contraction device and the fetal life solution as a whole play an important role in helping mothers share their contraction and health measurements data real time with healthcare providers to help make the mother make well-informed decisions about her pregnancy. With the fetal life solution, pregnant mothers can get care right at their fingertips, regardless of location. 
the My Feed Life app is available to download and has free interactive features like health measurement trackers, educational materials, and even an AI chatbot. For pregnancies that need more care, we offer a telemonitoring feature in our app as well, which helps reduce access to care issues, especially during such a pandemic. Mothers can interact with a nurse through the app and get the guidance they need whenever they want and have their questions answered. It puts a smile on my face. It always puts a smile on my face, knowing that Fetal Life Solution is helping make pregnancy a safer and more positive journey. But growing fetal life to this point wasn't easy. After coming up with the idea for the contraction device, I was worried that maybe I was too young to invent something. But I was driven by my passion for this idea, and I first pitched it to my parents. They supported my passion for helping pregnant moms, and we worked with patent lawyers to file the provisional patent application and then the non-provisional patent application in 2017. The patent process is definitely a journey that involves patience, and my mentors often reminded me that this process can be like a roller coaster with ups and with downs. There were times when the patent application required more follow-up applications, and I was worried about what would happen to my idea. But with tireless efforts, the support of my team, and patience for two and a half years, I was finally granted the patent for my contraction device in March 2020. I was very fortunate to have the support of my parents throughout every step of this journey. And they're my role models. They always guide me in the right direction. I'm also very thankful to have all the investors um, in my company and all my mentors to, who have always supported me throughout this journey. And I'm so thankful for their belief in me and their belief in Fetal Life's vision. I enjoy continuously learning from their experiences and guidance and growing not only as an innovator, but also as an individual. I learned through my journey that age truly is just a number. I realized people appreciated my idea even more due to my young age. They were impressed that a high schooler was so willing to work towards a noble cause and help the community. I realized that it doesn't matter how young you are. You're never too young to begin pursuing your ideas, to begin innovating and going through the patent process. You all are here today for one main reason, your passion for thinking differently. I applaud all of your efforts and encourage you all to continue to solve key problems and remember that age really just is a number. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, Rhea. That was amazing. That's an amazing and impressive story. So now we'd like to um, give the students that are listening to an opportunity to, you know, give you some questions, ask you some questions. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, how are we going to do this, Joe? Is it better if they ask in the chat or do you want to unmute them so they can just ask? Yeah, we can set it up. Um, the group's been pretty well behaved thus far, so we can go ahead and um, allow participants to unmute themselves when we call on them, if that's okay? That's okay. All right. If everyone can just, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. We'll call on you. And then um, once you're called on, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. The first one's A, A, and T. Um, hey, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I was just wondering, since like artificial intelligence is like a field that can be constantly iterated on, I was wondering how you would go about getting a patent for like an AI algorithm. Um, Oh, so, yeah. Rhea, Rhea, don't, don't even try. That's a tough question. That's a, that's a definitely a patent kind of related question that we could probably an, a, answer that at the end of the presentation. I wouldn't want to put you on the spot with that one because that's a little bit of a difficult um, question to answer. So A, A, and T, don't worry. We'll get back to you at the end, but definitely ask the PTO that question because it's, a, it's an interesting uh, response that we have for that question. All right, thank you. Sorry for it. Oh, no no you're worries. Thank, thank you for the great question. If anyone else has questions, feel free to use the hand raise feature um, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and we can bring you on. It looks like we have a question that's coming through the chat here um, asking about um, how did you how do you how did you know that your design was feasible, Rhea? Yeah, so um, definitely a lot of research went into the idea. So when I came up with the product, um, the first thing I did after pitching to my parents was background research. What devices um, exist in the pregnancy market? What devices potentially are similar to mine? And um, what I realized was that 
there were these very expensive contraction monitors that were being used in hospitals that costed $3,000 and they weren't portable at all. They weren't affordable. And that's um, knowing all this information, I was able to set requirements for what I wanted in my product and how I wanted to structure the contraction monitoring device. So I realized that my device could be feasible because one, there was a need for this device in the pregnancy market. And there was a need for helping mothers who face false positive contractions so that they can um, monitor their contractions remotely. And two, cost is always definitely something you have to keep in mind. But I was very fortunate that I had supporters who were willing to help me cost-wise through the um, patent journey and um, you know getting my device started. So I hope that answers your question. Awesome. I think that was a great answer. We've got a lot of questions coming in. I had another one that came in in the chat before we got some hands raised. We'll go to the hands next. Um, uh, the next question uh, was, how many people did you need to complete that design? It takes a team, but um, the design, the idea the, for the device and the design was my idea. So um, I did multiple drafts for it. I talked with multiple people, um, you know, safe, close people, because you don't want to reveal um, your idea too soon to anyone before you get some protection for it. But um, yeah, through, by talking with a lot of people, I was able to, um, what was the question? <laughs> oh, oh, how, how many long people? Did it take to, or oh, how, how many? many people? Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I made the design by myself, but also then did a lot of um, work with the University of Louisville, um, engineering department. So I gave them all the requirements, what I needed to be done. Um, and they kind of helped guide me. Oh, great. And then, uh, so we've got a question here. I'll switch it to the hands. Uh, Rena, you're the first one with your hand raised. So Rena, if you've got a question, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask away. Um, yeah. So my question was, how did you get started with like programming? Because First, you need to obviously have some knowledge and background to go ahead and like make this um, um, product. Like, how did you get started with that? Yeah, so um, as you heard in my speech, I was 15 years old when this all got started. So I actually did not know much about coding. Um, and I was learning. I worked with a technology team to develop the app, and I was learning through the whole process. I was taking AP computer science classes at school. So I had that knowledge. I knew what the engineering design process was like, and I'm continuing to learn more and more coding. And that's part of the reason you all are so, so impressive to me. Um, just as you guys are here to listen to my speech, I'm here um, learning from you all. <laughs> All right, great. And I think we have time for just one more. So we'll go to um, Angela in the chat. Angela, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yes, um, I kind of wanted to ask about the timeline. Like, did you get the patent before putting in a whole lot of work or did you get a lot of the, you know, the work done and then go get the patent and also give an idea of like how much it costs for the patent, like what's reasonable? Yeah, so um, the when I had this idea in place, I started thinking about patents pretty early on because I definitely wanted to get that protection for um, the intellectual property. Because when you start up a company, it's very important to have that protection. And um, so as I, I filed the patent application in October, 2017, and the application, obviously we were working through the follow-ups, um, what are requirements needed to be met for that. But while we were waiting on this um, device to you know, hopefully get a patent, we were working on growing um, fetal life as a company. And I actually recently got the patent in March, 2020. So it was a two and a half year journey. It takes a long time. Um, the pricing is also, <laughs> it's a lot, it's a good amount. Um, but I was very fortunate in that way. Okay, great. Actually, it sounds like we, we do have time for just another question or two. I'm just trying to make sure we uh, stay on time here. Um, so let's go to uh, Matalasa. 
Hey, thank you, Rhea. That was such an impressive one. Uh, my question is, so you uh, also, while you were setting up this company and everything, you took part in the Congressional Challenge? And which one- 5.45 p.m. Hello, yeah. Which one preceded, I think somebody is, uh, uh, okay. Which one preceded? You, uh, you took part in Congressional App Challenge and that's how you came to know the patent office or did you approach them beforehand uh, to get your patent? So I actually have never participated in the Congressional App Challenge. I was just fortunate enough to be invited here to speak. But um, I learned about the patent process actually through my dad. He's a role model for me. And he, at that time in um, 2017, he was working for an Intel digital health company in which he was working with a variety of medical devices. So he was very much exposed to, you know, what goes into the patent process. So he used to always tell me um, about different devices he's working on. And I was always very amazed. So I really was excited about the patent process and that's how I knew about it. Yeah, Thank, and you, then, Rhea. Thank you so much. And then Rhea, I, I'd note, you know, that was only our second year hosting congressional app challenges. And so a lot less of Congress is hosting at the time. Uh, this year, over uh, two thirds of the House of Representatives are hosting congressional app challenges. And so a lot more students like you will be able to get involved this year and years going forward. Um, all right. So I think we will go ahead and wrap the Q&A there. But Rhea, thank you so much for joining us um, and for sharing uh, your incredible story. It's really inspiring. And I know um, I wish we could get all to, the, to all of these great questions that the students have asked. But thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here and good luck to everyone. Thank you. And Rhea, we know you have an exam tonight, so good luck. Keep up the good work. Um, we'll be looking to uh, see and hear more about you and your success. I'm sure we'll hear about you on television someday. <laughs> awesome. Thanks oh, for coming. Oh, too nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Dr. Thank B, you. I think um, we've got to speed this up just a little bit because we want to make sure we get to the activity and the breakout rooms where you guys can have a little bit of fun. So why don't we go ahead to um, just the patent slide. Go ahead, Dr. Right there. Uh, Juan, you're on. Let's talk a little bit about the types of patents that you can get. We'll go over patents, we'll go over copyright, and then we'll get to the breakout session. Sure, sounds good. Hello, everybody. So in terms of, of patents, real quick before I go into what you see on the slide here, I did just want to inform you that um, it was mentioned earlier, but a patent does give you the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, and or importing uh, your invention into the U.S. So it's very important those words exclude, right? So a lot of people hear the word patent and think it gives you the right to automatically make something, and that's that's actually not the case. It's an, it's an exclusionary um, patent right, uh, uh, intellectual property right, so that means you can exclude others. And we can talk about that more in the Q&A, but I did want to uh, get that out of the way. So in order to qualify for a patent, there's, there's actually three types of patents. Um, the plant patent is not on here. We're not going to go over that today. But the other two are a utility patent. And in order to qualify for a utility patent, there's four statutory categories. All right. There's a, there's a machine. Um, if your invention's a machine, then it qualifies. If it is a product that's made, that's a qualification, a composition of matter. And then the last one, I saved the best for last because we're, we're talking about apps here. And, and if you're going to get a patent for an app, then it's going to be this last statutory category, which is a process of doing something or a process of making something. And, and right, so a lot of times um, when you're using a, your app, it's a process. You're going through a process to do something else. And so that would qualify for a utility patent. And under a utility patent, you're going to get 20 years of protection from the date that you file that patent application. That's an important number to remember. 20 years from the date that you file. And so, and then, so that's the utility, it's a function, what it does, the process that it goes through, right? And so it can't just be an abstract idea, right? Your process has to take, take something and do something with it. Um, and if you can, an easy way to think about it is if you can do it in your head, most likely not gonna qualify for a patent, right? So you have to take, gotta be a little more than just that abstract idea that you can do in your head. And then the next one is a design patent, right? And so a design patents are unique in that they're not really important. They're, actually, they're not, they don't care at all what it does, right? It's, it's all in the name, design. It's all the ornamental design, the unique look and feel of, of what it is. And so you're, for a design patent in software, you're gonna have to tie that graphical user interface. That's the design that you're, you're gonna get your design patent on. But you're gonna have to tie it to what it's used in. So 
if you're on a, a tablet, you're going to have to include the tablet in that in that design patent application or a, some sort of device, a phone or a, a laptop or, or, or a computer. Um, right. And so design patents are different from utility patents in that they give you 15 years of protection from the date that the patent actually issues. So that's the key distinction between a utility patent, which is 20 years from the date of filing, and a design patent, which is 15 years from the date of issue. And those are really the two main um, patents that you're going to be looking at as you strategically come up with um, how you, you would like to, to protect your patents. And so I think that that's really good um, for this slide tonight. I don't know if we have anything Excellent. else. Excellent. No, that's perfect. We just kind of want to, you know, hit it and move on and go to the next slide and make sure we've covered the three types of intellectual property that are certainly important. Ms. Ward talked to you a little bit about trademark. Juan just mentioned uh, uh, patents. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about copyright protection because it is so important that you think about how you're protecting the various parts, right? Remember there was a question about can you protect ideas? No, everything, patents, copyright, trademark, everything is kind of transferred into something that you can see. Those icons, you can see them. A poem, I can read it, right? A patent, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can do some taking ideas, putting in a tangible form. All three of those types of protection require some kind of physical manifestation, right? Now, copyright, what does it cover? It covers songs, music. You may wanna have music in the background of your app or your game. You may wanna run a short video, that's a movie. That can be protected by copyright. Uh, books, software, code. You know, these things are so, so important to the app developers. If you've got an amazing character, you better protect that character, right? That was your creativity. You thought of that character. You put it down somehow. Now, here's the question. What do you mean by some tangible form? Well, if it's a poem, you write it down. If it's a song, you got to sing it and record it or something. But just singing it, there's no protection for a song that you think of in your head. Sing it, and that's it. You got to take that song out of your head, either put it on paper, score it, or record it, all right? There you go. So that's copyright protection. How much protection? Well, 70 years worth. It's 70 years plus the life of the author. What does that mean? Not just 70 years. It means the person has to pass away first. Then you count the 70 years. So in fact, they may in enjoy more than 70 years of protection. I'm so glad you're enjoying this one. I see you smiling. I see you. <laughs> okay, boys, uh, boys and girls, let's go, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we're, oh, here we go. It has to be fixed. Fixed is what I was explaining. It actually has to be in some kind of original form. There you see an, a, a copy of it, uh, code right there. That's important because you guys are talking about developing apps, okay? So let's go to the next slide, Dr. V. Um, last slide, and then we're going to go right to the app chat and put the students in breakout rooms, and we're going to go ahead and start developing our app. Rhea actually alluded to this. She alluded to this. Yeah. So that's great. I love your responses. I love your responses. That's interesting. Is somebody going to hit A? Go ahead and hit A for me. Yes, great, because now, <laughs> now we have all of the choices. That means D is the correct cho choice. You definitely want to be careful who you tell what's going on with your intellectual property or your app or your thing. Um, tell them it's a secret. Make sure, they don't, make sure you're talking to trusted people. Do not um, tell people that you don't trust because you don't know what they're going to do. They may be in a position to kind of get it out there before you sign a non-disclosure agreement. What is that? It's just a legal document says, that says you will not tell anybody. And if you do tell someone, here's what I expect to happen if you actually disclose my invention. And certainly you can file an application. You can file a non-provisional, the real deal, or a provisional application that gives you kind of a little bit of time to kind of work through some things. Not a real, doesn't um, turn into any right of any sort, but it definitely gets you to the point where you have something filed on record of what your actual invention is. So the correct answer is, thank you everybody, it is D. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, Dr. V, if you can go ahead and skip past all of that. Um, uh, Gwen, why don't you go ahead and cover this slide real quick, and then we'll go on to app check. Okay, we had it so everything would fly in, but in the interest of time, we wanted to make sure that you could see everything. When you, everybody has a phone, 
or some type of electric, electronic equipment, laptop, computer, whatever it is, that is all wrapped up in intellectual property. It has trademarks attached to it, patents and copyrights. You don't think about it, but it's there. And so this slide basically represents, think about your app, your invention as something more than just, it's only one patent that could come out of it or one trademark when it comes to your branding, or I could only have one copyright. You have to think of it as a whole. So this is an iPhone, although I love my Samsung, I tolerate iPhones for this demonstration. When you look at the trademarks, you have the Apple logo, the iPhone, and the iOS Safari. Think about again, when Ms. Joyce was talking, she was like, trademarks represents the source of goods. So anytime you see that partially bitten apple, or you hear I anything, you know to associate that with an Apple product, an iPhone, or iTunes iOS is the operating system. That's all falls under trademarks. Um, there is no other product that uses the Safari internet page except for Apple products. When you think about patents, as Mr. Juan had said, we were talking about utility patents that go along with it. So for this particular phone, some of the patents that go with it are semiconductor circuits that go into how everything works, you know, you get the touch screen, the battery or control powers, antennas, speakers, device housing, and potentially mobile apps. Depending on how you have those claims written, you could potentially get protection for your apps as well. When you think about the copyrights, it goes to the software code. Now, mind you, you have to divulge the code, but there are certain parts that you can keep secret if that code is part of your trade secrets. And we really didn't talk about that, but trade secrets are those things that you don't tell anybody about. You're not gonna file anything to try to get protection for it. It's those things that you kind of keep quiet and within your business or amongst those you're working with. Um, some of a famous trademarks are the secret recipe to KFC or my all time favorite, the recipe to Krispy Kreme glazed donuts. There's nothing better than a hot Krispy Kreme glazed oh, donut. Ow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> your, your instruction manual and the ringtones can also be copywritten. And so think about your product, not just as one little thing, but think about it overall and what your IP portfolio, your intellectual property portfolio will look like for your business and for your app. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, great job. Now, Dr. V, it's um, time for us to go to our brainstorming sessions and get everybody to participate. This is intended to be fun. So uh, Joe is going to send everybody to a room. We're gonna meet you there, but what are we gonna do there? We are actually on our way to developing a really cool app and thinking about the appropriate intellectual property. So as you can see, I have already started my app. Now, you're going to either decide if you're going to think of a pet app or a sports app. Pet or sports. I decided to go ahead and start a pet app. What does my app do? My app is called Vetty Ready, and it helps pet owners find the nearest vet. Okay? So I want you to go and use your whiteboards and use your brain, brainstorm among yourselves, your family, whoever's in your environment, your virtual world, and come up with a really cool idea for your app. We're gonna walk our way through this to hopefully by the time you're done, you will actually even have your storyboarding done so we can actually think through and see what your app is all about. So let's go, Joe, send us to our room and we will be back in 15 minutes. Actually, let's do 10 minutes because I think we're going to have to pick up some time. So let's just do 15 minutes for the brainstorming. 15 or 10. Okay, you guys, thank you. Um, that was actually a lot of fun. Um, Team leads, do you guys have any examples that you would like to share? I know we have one in, from our um, session, and uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll see if there's one from, let's see, uh, Chris and Gwen. Um, no, Chris and Joyce. <laughs> Hello, cheers. You have one, a name or an app that someone came up with that they want to talk about? Share with the group. So um, we do have the whiteboard. I want to make sure we had a couple of really good questions. One is, 
if we're sharing our ideas about these really cool apps, are we actually putting ourselves in danger of someone taking our idea and running with it? And so uh, we were just asking our group if anyone felt strongly that they did not want to share something that they had on the whiteboard. Um, so. Well, that's wanna... really interesting. Okay, that's a really good point. So if they feel strongly about that, how about just sharing the name and not the app co concept? Bark. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Is it spelled B A R K or some really interesting, cool way? <laughs> it is B A R K exclamation point. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds great. <laughs> Definitely not an enabling disclosure. Uh, so we're okay. <laughs> and maybe if you could just yeah let people know too what an enabling disclosure yeah. is. Okay, so just to be just to be sure and clear about this. When you say you don't want people to, uh, you, you're afraid to tell people your idea, the patent work office, when you, it's a problem when you disclose your idea where someone can, from that disclosure, actually learn uh, exactly how to make and use your invention, pretty much. Um, so if I am just giving really scant details like Bark, that doesn't tell me anything about your invention. There's nothing that I could do, no matter how smart you might be. There's nothing that I could, there's no way I can figure out what Bark is. So if Bark is an invention and you just say Bark, you disclose it, oh, my idea is Bark, no problems there. But if someone, like if, uh, a computer scientist could absolutely understand exactly how your thing, how your app is going to work, and you tell them enough details that they could go ahead and write it down, practice your invention, that, that's a problem. But it's only a problem in the US after one year, right? Because if you can actually run to the office, get it filed before that one year, you don't, the rules you know, are not running against you. Um, that's a lot of detail, but we can talk a little bit more about enabling disclosures at the end of the session. And someone else asked, were we gonna talk about how to file an application? We can also talk about that at the end, I just wanted to kind of give everybody a really cool experience with the app. Um, so let's go. Thank you, Bark. Thank you, Joyce and Chris. Okay, Juan and Gwen. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and, and ask anyone in my room to raise your hand if you would like um, like to tell us really quickly about your app idea. We had some really cool ideas, but for fear of disclosure, uh, Joyce, it's <laughs> a very good point. <laughs> please, please go ahead and, and raise your hand uh, if you want to tell us about your, I, I, you know, um, so if, if no one raises their hand in the next, you know, five seconds, I think we can move on. I'll, 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 I can't give you the name of one of them because it kind of gives it away, it, it, although it's really cool, I think it is at least. Um, so, yeah, I would love to play this game. All right, good. Treyas, please. Yes, I think this is the one um, that uh, I was talking about. So. So my app is just, it's called Rate My Distancing. And yeah. so you can put in all the information about how you've been social distancing and it'll give you a score that you can share with your friends. Awesome. If I heard him well, nice. he said a social distancing app, one that is so important right now, so relevant. Is that right, Juan? Yeah, Rate, rate My Distancing is the name. And uh -huh. so it, 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 it measures your interactions with other people and then it gives you a social distancing score um and then based on that score you know you can you can do things and and i don't know maybe i'm giving too much away here but um you know it gives you tips on maybe how to improve your score and things like that uh, but i yeah i would definitely be working with my friends and, and family and and comparing and maybe using it <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome good job good amazing okay tamika and i also had um some really cool ideas go ahead tamika who was who who shared their calorie counting app? I think it was Elena. Okay, Elena, you want to share? All right, I can go ahead and unmute Elena. Thank you. So I came up with a name, a fifth <laughs> Like so, I uh, just it's um, it's just based on my son's idea of keeping our cat fit. 
So the cat will be, the application will help the owner uh, to calculate the calories um, a cat have, has during the day, including like how much food and what kind of food cat consume and what kind of exercise it does just to maintain the healthy balance. Excellent. Thank you, Elena. And we had some really awesome names. Is it Nitic? Nitic or Michael? What were your names? We love those names. Let's see. Is that Michael Batavia? Yes. Michael? Yeah. And what was your name for Elena's device, for her app? Oh, uh, Cat's Cow. Cat Cow. Counting calories for cat. Spelled K-A-T-K-A-L. Love it. You guys did an amazing job. Um, Jorge. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a, I'll share my screen because I took a snapshot of it. Okay. So, um, I wanted to make sure I took the, the, <laughs> I saved the file here before, um, before we were forced to go back into the, into the main session. But here are some of the descriptions that came up and, uh, I, uh, I prompted them with little checks and stars so that they would be encouraged to put more um, ideas up on the board. Uh, but if anybody from the team that was with, with, uh, with me wants to speak to your application, your app, that would be awesome. Either Petfinity, I know this one down here. Petfinity, uh, that sounds nice. That does, yeah. that sounds interesting. Yeah, Wheels Up, a location finder for wheelchair sports meetups. Oh, and, and nice. Yeah. There was another student who wanted to build up, a, build off of that idea, an extension of that. So who has, a, who has or where is the best modified vehicle, vehicle for handicapped parking? But students, if you have any, uh, if you want to speak to your app, uh, this is your chance. Yeah. Raise your hand so we know who to unmute. Yeah. I want to put it in the chat that you could share Petfinity, Jorge. I'm sorry? Adit Aditya? Put it in the chat. Share a little bit about yeah, it. You can share about Petfinity. Okay, can we unmute her? Let's see. Yeah, she should be able to unmute herself now, uh, but I can find her unmute. Yep, she should be unmuted. Okay. All right. So uh, Petfinity is an app where you can find local parks for your pets. So like convenient to take your pets out. You can also find like little pet daycares that are going around in your community if you need to drop your pets off for like a day. And then you can also find like local pet sitters to take care of your pets while you're away on vacation or just away from the house. Outstanding. Outstanding. This is great. You guys, um, we've got to speed it up a little bit. We said we would be done at 6.30, but we are also going to stay on for an extra 30 minutes to answer questions that people might have. So let's go ahead, you guys, and we're going to get through just one. We won't get through the entire activity today. Sorry about that. But we will go to the second part. We'll break out. We'll at least do the Captivate. Then we'll come back and see where we are, and then we'll answer some questions. So now that you guys have come up with these really cool, amazing app ideas, the thing that I want you to get out of this is that you have to be intentional about the protection, thinking about what does it look like? Well, how does it sound? What will people, um, how will people respond to it? And we have five steps. So how do you figure out how people will respond to your app before putting it in the app store? You do a survey, you take a poll, right? We're gonna skip that because, that step because we don't have time, but it is important for you to know, after you come up with these really cool ideas, really cool logos and marks and all of that, run it by somebody before you make a significant investment in your app or your app icon or even coding, right? So let's go ahead to Captivate. Next screen, please, Jorge. The second step here, and this is all we're going to do, is I want you to put the name of your app on the whiteboard, Think about what your logo or icon would look like and what's your slogan. I'll go ahead and share my Betty Ready information with you. Go ahead, Jorge, and show them Betty Ready. There it is. Wow, there's my app. Betty Ready, there's my little logo with my little cat and the paws and the ambulance. That's just really cool. And then need help for your pet, then text a vet. OMG. Love it. Really cool slogan catchy, it's short, look at my colors, it's red and white and a little black, it's consistent. So go ahead, you geniuses, go back into your uh, brainstorming session 
and come up with a really cool logo or slogan for your app. We'll meet back here in 15 minutes and we will then just switch this since you guys have lots of questions about the patent process and filing. We'll stay online to answer your questions about those things. So go ahead, team leads. We'll see you back in the breakout rooms and back here in the main session in 15. Our, 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 our participants have been amazing. We recognize it as 634. Here's what, here's what we're gonna do. We'll have a couple people share out. Um, then we're gonna just finish up. I think you get the, the, the idea that protection is important. You have to be intentional about you know, what you're doing, what you're drawing, what you're thinking about. Um, that you can use all forms of these uh, protection that we talked about, patents, trademarks, and copyright, as you're moving along, think about it. We're going to share out, and then we're going to allow people to you know, log off if they want, or stay on and use the chat, or unmute yourselves to ask us specific patent-related questions that you may be... Um, uh, or trademark. Up, or trademark <laughs> questions, or copyright questions, whatever is <laughs> on your mind, we will actually take those questions um, between 6.30 and 7.00. If I fail to mention at the end, we will be doing virtual um, office hours on September 29th, or 28th from three o'clock to four o'clock. There's a slide in here that tells you about it. You can also find it on our website. So on September 28th from three to four, if you just wanna do some follow-up questions, ask us anything, we will be online just to take your questions. And I would actually encourage you to do that. All right, this is free help. Don't spend a dime until you maximize <laughs> all of the free help and assistance that we can give you, okay? So go ahead and uh, let's see, Joyce and Chris, do you have, you wanna share? Well, we'd love to share the wonderful drawing that we have, but instead, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna ask for a volunteer from our room to share the concept and the name. And anyone from your room, yes. if you wanna, oh, great, somebody's got it. Yes. Okay, um, we had a wonderful team and uh, there was somebody who just gave a wonderful a diagram for the Tinder pet. We incorporated both the pet and the sport together in our app. And this app will get the pet lovers together and they can meet in a pet park and uh, keep a sport, sporting event for the pets maybe, who can go grab a ball fast, uh, who can go snatch anything for them. And uh, <laughs> our slogan uh, for this uh, a Tinder pet was uh, both love and play are four-legged words. Oh, nice. Excellent. <laughs> Good job. Outstanding. Outstanding. Gwen and Juan, I know you guys got something. Yeah. We, um, we Thank had, you, Savita. We had a couple um, couple folks share their, um, their logos with us. And so um, I don't know if it's allowed or not, uh, if they can share their screen to show everybody if they want to. Otherwise, um, they can just describe it to us. Uh, is that allowed, Joe? I don't know if that's allowed. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's fine. They can feel free to share. All right, so um, Shreyas, if, if you would like to go ahead and, and show us your um, logo first. So this is, this is rate, rate my, or is it rate my distancing or rate your distancing? It's a rate my distancing, so I can share right now. Oh, nice. What? Very nice. I'm going to take a picture of that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh. <laughs> you not what we saw. That is awesome. Very nice. Oh, yeah. Very nice. Oh, with the mask and everything. Love it. Oh, yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> I knew you guys had something good for me. Oh, okay. That is What's the slogan? Thank you. Uh, we decided not to use a slogan just because uh, Rate My Distancing already kind of describes what the app is. So. Got it. I didn't want too much text on the app logo. Outstanding. It's very clean, nice. I love the stars and the uh, ratings and the mask. Oh, yeah. Very that's nice. Outstanding. Well, outstanding. Okay, Jorge, Dr. V, what you got for me? Okay. Um, so what do I have? Uh, some pictures here. Let me just share it quickly. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I think it's this one. Yep. All right. So we have three inventors. Uh, oh, wow. Atticus and Addy, if you guys uh, want to talk to your inventions, your app inventions. So how about, um, Rohan, why don't you go first with Orange AI? Sure. So uh, we've named our app Orange AI, and it's basically um, a health app that like 
lets you conveniently keep track of a multitude of things. Um, it's calorie based. So basically it'll like, uh, it recommends exercises and such for losing calories. And also it'll uh, have like a recipe storage place where you can easily access known recipes for uh, gaining calories and such. So it's just like an easy way to like, keep track of your life. Um, it's based around the main functionality is that you can, we're trying to incorporate it, like an AI feature where you can take a picture of some food and then you'll get stats for it. So then you, you can make the choice. Do I want to eat this now? How much do I want to eat? Simple things like that. Excellent. And, uh, Outstanding. Yeah. And uh, I just want to talk about the slogan for a bit. Um, since for our, our whole stick is like the convenience and simple nature of all of this, uh, and our name is Orange AI, we, I kind of want to connect those two ideas by saying it's as simple as fruit or as easy as fruit because people associate fruit and such with being simple snacks and, you know, you know what I mean. Outstanding. Yes, very, Outstanding. very clever. Very intentional, very clever. Love it. We're going to just move on to um, one more, Jorge. I'm sorry, I can't. we can't do all of them, but I see shoot, scan, submit, done. Wow, you got some really good uh, participation in that session. Um, Tamika, I think we have one from our group. Is uh, We're the last group, right? Yeah. Okay, we have one, and I think, is it Elena or Michael? Who came up with it? Actually, it was Nitic, and I think they work together. Michael, you want to say it or Nitic, Nithic? Our the 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 app was Golf Fit. Somebody, yeah. unmute yourself, Michael, Elena. Okay, they're all muted for some reason. Let's see. They would have to take themselves okay. off mute. Okay, Michael's ready to speak. Great. Um, so the, the, the idea is golf it and, um, I forgot the slogan. Oh no. The slogan is shoot to the moon, get your golf it soon. <laughs> 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 and what does the app do? So if you, it takes a sensor and connects it to a, a golf club and the sensor uses Bluetooth con to connect to your phone. So when you sing, swing your club and hit the ball, it um, uses the wind speed and direction to determine where your ball will end up. All right, outstanding. You guys have been amazing, great participation. You made working in this virtual space easy and fun. And um, it's something that we were a little nervous about, but it all worked out. Thank you for your great participation. As I said before, if you have follow-up questions and you have to leave now, we have virtual office hours September 28th from three to four o'clock. But um, since there are a few of you still on the line, thank you for your feedback, we appreciate it. Um, <laughs> there are a few of you still online. If you want us to hang around and you wanna ask questions um, specifically about filing, how you file, all of that, we are happy to answer your questions until about seven o'clock. So if you have them, go ahead and shoot. You can raise your hand, you can put questions in the chat uh, box and we will um, take your questions. Yeah, and I'll say as, as we're waiting on questions, um, uh, we'll be sure to include the information about the office hours and the follow-up email that we do to all the students. And so um, for the students out there who are wondering how do I find those office hours, we're happy to provide that information um, to everybody via email afterward if that works for you. Thank you. All right. And oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and Joe, I know we had a few questions in that first round of the session. I don't know if those were captured in the chat or not. Yeah, I can see if I can find, if, I'll, I'll see if we can get back to them. I do have a question here from A, A, and T. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and feel free to, to ask away. Uh, hey, uh, I, have a, I have a couple of questions, but um, I guess we'll see if, you know, we can address the other ones. But uh, my main question is, firstly, how would we go about filing this patent? Like, are there a lot of supplementary materials we might need when we're trying to submit this patent? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So whenever you file an application, there are many, many things. We've actually simplified things for you today just because we need to make it fun and engaging. But filing an application takes a lot of time and a lot of work. As Rhea mentioned, it requires a little bit of patience. 
I think the best advice and something that I talked about in my breakout room is that you want to do your homework. You want to do your research. You want to make sure you're not doing something that someone else has done. So you might want to do a search, right? So use our website to do a patent search. Whatever name you come up with, do a trademark search as well. Because again, you want to spend a lot of time figuring things out before you invest one penny into, you know, filing an application. You don't want to send an application to the patent office that on something that you know is there that you could have just put in the words, you know, I don't know, um, dog catcher. And here comes a million dog catchers. You really do want to spend some time trying to do a search. If you can't do it, then find an organization or a person that can assist you. We, we have a lot of free services and uh, ways that you can get assistance. Our patent and trademark resource centers. There are some law firms that will do some pro bono work for you. But visit our website. Go to uspto.gov and find inventor resources and start there. And then you'll, you'll get a lot of information about how you should move forward and who you could talk to. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got some questions in the chat here. Um, I have one. Uh, why is it called the Congressional App Challenge? I guess I can field that one. Go ahead, Jim. Um, <laughs> so the Congressional App Challenge is um, an initiative uh, from the uh, House of Representatives uh, to encourage more students from more places uh, across the country to get involved in uh, STEM fields and computer science. Uh, this is our sixth year hosting Congressional App Challenges. 306 members of Congress are currently hosting coding competitions in their district for students um, who are their constituents. Um, and each of those districts will have a unique winner. Uh, so every district gets a winner. All of those winners are invited to Washington, D.C., COVID pending this spring, um, to, uh, to see their app displayed in the Capitol and to show it off to, uh, to all of Congress. So um, that's why we call it the Congressional App Challenge. Uh, it's super innovative, super, uh, super exciting. And uh, hopefully all of you guys take your great ideas and submit to the App Challenge this year. Excellent. It looks like Ma Halasa has a question. Yes, ma'am, I do. Um, I'm a high schooler and uh, I, I, I did come up with an idea. Unfortunately, my parents, um, I, I know I'm a little precocious, so, <laughs> but my parents, uh, they aren't in the computer field and uh, I have come up with an idea and I always, my, my mom says that it's really nice. I really don't know how to go about patenting it. So uh, my first question and my greatest concern is uh, once I take this step of patenting, how much is it going to cost me? And uh, uh, because I really need to let my parents know that. That's a great question. We're gonna let Gwen Blackwell answer that question and tell you a little bit about the micro entity status and small entity status. Go ahead, Gwen. Tanaga. <laughs> the, <laughs> we do have a sliding um, scale to pay fees when it comes to filing a patent application. If you're just talking about yourself, you've never filed a patent application before and you meet all the requirements for a small entity status, then you can apply for a micro entity status if you meet certain additional features, such as um, you have to have an income. There's an income requirement. I'm pretty sure as a student, you're not gonna be even close to that income requirement. There's also, uh, have you filed any other patent applications? Do you have your names on anything? That also goes into the micro entity status. As a part of that, you pay significantly reduced fees, about 75% less than the large entity status. And so when it comes to filing a provisional application, it would only cost you, I believe it's $65 right now to file a provisional application to file a non-provisional application, which is actually examined by a patent examiner, it's gonna cost a, a couple, it could cost around a couple thousand dollars or so. You need to be aware of that. However, like Ms. Tanaga said, there are programs that are available to help with the prosecution side of things, such as the USPTO pro bono program. There's also the law school clinic program that has um, law school students that work to prosecute your application on the patent side of things, there's also trademark law school clinics. So you could actually go to a law school, go through their um, application process and get their help with that. And if you find that those don't necessarily work, you could also do it yourself. We try to say don't necessarily do it yourself because it is an involved process and we wanna make sure that you get the protection that you deserve. The best way to do is go to USPTO, 
.gov, G-O-V, and then go to, if you're looking at patents, forward slash patents, or if trademarks, forward slash trademarks, and that way you can find even more information as to what you need for filing, the paper requirements, the fee requirements, and everything else that goes along with it. Great job, Gwen. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, uh, Joe, in the chat? Yeah, someone asked, um, does a domain name for a website need to be copyrighted or patented? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Joyce, do you have an answer? But I would say probably no, but go ahead, Joyce. There's another place. Right, I was going to say just in terms of domain names, it so it wouldn't be copyright, wouldn't be patent. Um, if you are using it as a trademark, not just as the name for your domain, um, but as a source identifier, then you might consider a trademark um, for the wording itself, but the domain name, to get a domain name, that's a separate registration or a separate register that you would go to. So if you're interested in getting a domain name for your website, then you would register that, um, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, but if you are interested in using it also as a trademark, then that's the trademark application. And, and so you, I'll, I'll put more ahead, detail Joe. in the, I, I was just gonna say, I'll put more detail in the chat, but happy to also provide more, more information on that as well. And if you just have time on your hand and you wanna, want some interesting reading, Dr. V brought, our, uh, brought a recent case to our attention um, the Supreme Court case about booking.com. That's mm -hmm. a really interesting intellectual property case. And if you have nothing else to do, go ahead and pull that case up and read that case. And I think it'll speak directly to your question. Booking.com, Supreme Court case. Go yes. ahead, Joe. No. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. No, no, I, I wanted to jump in because there was a question at the very beginning around artificial intelligence and patenting AI algorithms. And I think uh, maybe one of us on the team can speak to that. Uh, I know we were talking about it just before we went on the air. Um, yeah, and that's a tough one. So, um, Gwen, if, I see you shaking your head, but I, I oh no, I, no, I was I was looking to see if the person was still here. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes, uh, A A yeah, and T. I, I asked it. Sorry. Okay. Yes, A A and T. So th let me give you the short answer. Um, Juan talked a little bit about the kinds of things, the subject matter, uh, things that can be patented. One thing that cannot be patented are basic uh, math equations, right? An algorithm in some cases is just that. It's just an equation or a set of instructions telling the machine to do something specific. So if you can't patent an, uh, 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 an equation because it's kind of abstract, then we have a problem. But it doesn't mean that algorithms themselves can't be patented. It just means that that equation, that math, those set of instructions have to do something specific. They have to be used perhaps with the computer to do something that we can see. And That's I'm just summarizing, to. you'll have to read up on this, but this is really it. You would get a rejection from us saying that pretty much if you tried to just patent the instructions themselves, you would get a rejection saying 101 is basically an abstract idea. We don't do that. We don't patent equations or simple algorithms. But if that algorithm, that mathematical equation does something specific, make that computer give you some kind of output, some kind of, I don't know, spreadsheet, some kind of thing, then it's more than an equation and it's more than just a set of instructions. But because this is being litigated probably every day now in the US, it's a tough call regarding AI. Because, you know, is it the machine that's inventing something or is it the person that's doing something? So again, if you have a lot of time on your hand, there are a lot of really cool cases now. I can't think of one by name, but just put in there algorithms and patenting and equations in the search term and just do some reading. So we can't just say algorithms cannot be patented, but so like we said to start, we need those um, instructions to produce something what? Tangible, something that we can see, something that gets that equation as an abstract thing out of your head so that people will know where is your property? What are we protecting? And if it's not placed in some kind of tangible form or something that we can see and feel, then we really don't know what we're protecting. So that's the best answer that I can give you. But again, go ahead and do some research on that one. Great, I think we have just one more question if we have time. Someone asked um, if they 
develop an app that is um, that's selected by their congressperson um, and they wanted to patent it um, what the process was like do they need to patent it before they release the app or if somebody's developing an app for the app challenge at what point do they need to take action um, with a patent or a trademark does anybody else want to answer that PTO folks okay nobody's jumping at the bit shame on you guys don't do this to me <laughs> You have all the energy. <laughs> He's like, I'm ready to go. I want to give this to everybody. No, go ahead. If, um, if anybody else wants to take a stab at that. Okay. Since no one's here, hearing nothing, I'll go ahead and take a stab at it. So I guess the best answer is I mentioned a little bit about the disclosure rule. They're pretty much, pretty much, we like to say, you know, patent before you sing patent before you disclose, before you go telling the world. And this is an important point. Here in the U.S., after you disclose your invention, if it's an enabling or not enabling, it doesn't matter. After you disclose your invention, well, it does matter. If it's an enabling disclosure, you have one year to get the application filed. So if you're in the app challenge and you go ahead and disclose it at the event, you still have one year in the U.S. to go ahead and file your application. No, no worries there. In Europe, that's not the case. Europe, requires absolute novelty. You file first and then you sing, right? But if you're worried about getting to protection here in the US, you have up to a year. The idea though is it's just a good practice to go ahead and file your application first so you can feel a little more comfortable about it. So not only just so you can feel comfortable, it gives you, number one, the exercise or the time it takes to think about filing an application is a really good exercise to really figure out what is it that you're trying to protect? What does this application do? What's the important part of this application? It, am I looking at someone else's? Am I actually encroaching on someone else's property? Am I do, getting so close to another app that perhaps I'm you know, causing some trouble for myself when it's time to go out and practice it? Someone might argue, hey, your app is too close to mine or it's just like mine. So bottom line is, if I'm giving advice and I'm not giving advice because we don't do that. But if you were someone in my family, here's what I would say. File first. Okay, great. All right. Um, Can I say something real quick? Yeah, yeah um, sure, absolutely. Not so much towards the question because I think you answered it wonderfully, Tanaga. There was, um, a, there was a statement by Viola Joy that the first thing she said, one of the things she said was, we seem like so much fun. It seems like a great place to work. And yes, the USPTO is a great place to work. I do have fun with this group out of Office of Education. They are fantastic whenever I'm allowed to go on the road with them. And they are. It's fun. One of the things that you put in the chat was about paying money out to get help. And we always want to make sure and say, beware of scammers. They're out there. They will take your money and not leave you necessarily with much of anything. The same way that you would do research into buying a car or spending a large amount of money to make sure that the model you want is correct or the house is where you want it or what have you, do the same thing for the people that you are um, potentially going to hand money over to prosecute either your trademark or your um, patent applications. Always do your research. See what's out there about them because check with the Better Business Bureau because there, there are people out there that will take your money and leave you with nothing. So you want to protect your intellectual property. Make sure you protect yourself by doing your research on whomever you're going to look at. And when it comes to patent agents and attorneys, if you're concerned about whether or not they're allowed to operate before the Patent and Trademark Office, we have a website. Um, from the USPTO.gov, you go to the Office of Enrollment and Discipline, or do a search and say registered agents, patent agents. You can find out whether or not the attorney or whomever you're talking to, if you're talking about having them um, prosecute your patent application, whether or not they're even allowed to. You have to have a number. So I took the patent bar back in 2001. I have my reg number. You won't find me because I work at the office. But I have a reg number. Um, anybody else's attorney or agent at the office that took the patent bar, they will have one as well. And so that's just 
if I was talking to my family because I can't give advice as Tanaga said, that's what I tell my family. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Gwen, thank you so much. I want to um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This was really incredible. Uh, thank you to Deputy Director Peter, to Tanaga, Joyce, Tamika, to Gwen, Jorge, to Juan, uh, and to Chris as well, to everybody at the USPTO for helping put this on. Um, this is really an incredible event. I will send out the information about your office hours. It looks like we've got some more questions. And so I'd encourage all those folks to go check out your office hours and ask them there. Um, for the Congressional App Challenge, guys, if you're coding, just make sure you um, register and submit your app by October 19th to get it in for this year's competition. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys for our next webinar. Have a good one. And thanks for having us, Joe. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Right, Thank you, Joe. Thank you.